Hello, everybody. Hope you can hear me okay. So I'm trying to figure out how this live stream thing works. And, uh, hi, Beth. So glad you could join us. We'll give, uh, Sister Stacy, good to see you. I'm going to give everybody just a minute to, uh, get logged on and I'm going to pull up the chat feature here on my uh, computer so I can see your comments because for some reason I don't see them on my phone and I thought I would be able to. Well, maybe I can, maybe. But I see who's joining. That's good. That's what I need to know. So, hi, Sarah. Glad you could join us. I've been missing teaching our class and getting to see everybody and uh, in the fellowship with one another. It's just not been the same the last few weeks. Hope you all are doing well. And if you have a prayer request or you have a testimony or you just want to share something, feel free to uh, comment and let us know. And um, <clears throat> at the end of tonight's lesson, because I would like us to have a chance to virtually fellowship, you may have already seen the post on the, uh, you may have already seen the post at the top of our group page here about our Zoom meeting. I know some of you had reservations about Zoom um, or didn't understand how to make it work or feel comfortable with it. So I knew most of us could work Facebook. So doing a live lesson gave us the ability to do uh, Facebook Live, doing, gave everybody the ability to see the lesson. But it would be fun, I think, to chat with one another, even if it's just for five, 10 minutes check in with everybody, see everybody's doing. Um, so after I'm done teaching at 7.30, I've set up a Zoom meeting for whoever wants to join. And uh, uh, we can fellowship one another. I, my understanding is you'll download the Zoom app and you'll follow the meeting, put in the me meeting information that I posted uh, at the top of the page and it will take you to a virtual waiting room and then I'll uh, authorize you to join the meeting and then we can all fellowship with uh, one another, um, and you may be able to just follow the link from the page, and it'll take you to the Zoom app and show you what to download. I'm not sure. I already have it set up on my computer, so uh, my wife had kind of helped me play with it a week or two ago, so um, <clears throat> anyways, I'll give everybody a few minutes to join, and uh, people may keep joining. Uh, Sister Tanea, hello. Brother Leno, Sister Delita, Brother Stubbs, good to see all of y'all. Uh, been missing you all. Some of you I've gotten to see a couple times in person. Um, some of you haven't and feels like it's been forever, uh, but it's good to virtually connect. Um, <clears throat> when we last had class, uh, we were discussing the topic of living the good life and the gospel of John. Uh, I, I felt compelled to save that for when we come back together uh, physically in a month or so. Um, but tonight, um, I want to share with you something the Lord's been dealing with me about, and that is, and I don't know how else to say this, and I hope you're not offended, but my big fat mouth. Um, I have allowed at times my spirit, as is easy to do, to get uh, jaded, and it comes out my mouth. Jesus said, out of the overflow of our hearts, the mouth speaks. Some of you ladies may have gotten to see the Bible study, my sister-in-law, taught tonight on one of Sister Bishop's ladies' pages about guarding our hearts. It's very, very, very important. And we know when someone is guarding their heart or not by what is coming out of their mouth. And somebody said, Brother Brian, how many lessons can you get out of this topic? And uh, I know I've got at least four weeks, but I think we could talk about it as long as we need to. It might take some of us four years to get total control of our mouth. But there's different things we can learn to control. The one I want to talk to us about tonight is the area of complaining. And Sister Bishop is giving me multiple hearts, so she must really like tonight's topic. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. That's good. Please I consider that a virtual amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Um, but I want to talk to us about complaining. Next week, we're going to deal uh, with either lying or gossiping. I haven't decided. But this week, I want to talk about what does the Bible say about complaining? And as I was thinking about complaining, I, I, remember, I was reminded 
of uh, multiple trips that my dad uh, took us on when we were when I was a teenager. Beth was a child, almost teenager, uh, to Orlando, and um, our family we're not poor, but we're not wealthy either. Dad worked very, very, very hard, and he uh, he saved and scrimped, and him and Mom poured their resources together. And for Christmas several years, they took us to Universal Studios, probably three or four years in a row. Uh, we loved it. It was fun. Um, and we're not beach people, really. Uh, but we love amusement parks and roller coasters. And uh, that's not Disney World, but it's the next best thing. And we like it better than Disney World does. It's the mecca of theme parks. And so we would go at least once a year. But that first year, Dad, he had worked so hard. He'd worked every job he could get. He'd saved every dollar he could, and he was just happy to get us in the 1992 Buick Park Avenue and get on the road and was so relieved to have the opportunity to travel and was so excited to get to bless his children. And I remember distinctly uh, several hours into that drive, and uh, we finally arrived at the destination, and something I said I remember distinctly that I complained and the look in his eye, he was so hurt that all the sacrifice he put forth to take his son and daughter on this nice trip that I would find something to complain about. You could tell he never said anything, but I could tell it wounded his spirit. And I immediately, I, I felt bad. I apologized. I, I tried to improve my attitude, but that stuck with me. Fast forward probably 10 years later, well, longer than that now, it's probably, goodness, ooh, maybe 15, 16 years later, Emory is now getting old enough to express an opinion, and I sacrificed, and we went on a trip not long ago, and she expressed a complaint, and I caught myself, that same spirit that I could tell hit my dad of, do I say something, do I just took it, but it, it, hit my heart. And I said, now you know how your dad felt when you complained all those years ago. Complaining doesn't do anything to change our circumstance. It doesn't do anything to change our situation. It only harms those who hear the complaint, mainly ourselves. And when I think of complaining in the Bible, I'm reminded of the Israelites, how they murmured and complained in the wilderness. Now, think about this. To us, it's so obvious. God sent 10 plagues. He parted the Red Sea. He drowned Pharaoh's army. Then, as if that wasn't enough, he has Moses chop down a tree and put it into bitter water. And now bitter water is sweet tasting water. He has manna come down from heaven and feed them. He has Moses strike a rock and water pours out of it. They have clothes that never wear out. But the Israelites, it seems like over and over again, they whined, they griped, they complained. And Exodus chapter 14, verse 11 says that they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Lord or to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So they express that they would rather have died in Egypt than to have followed Moses in what they considered the God-forsaken wilderness. Moses tells them in Exodus 16, you are not grumbling against us, but you are grumbling against the Lord. Now, some of you like myself maybe feel guilty already. Maybe we've been complaining a lot lately. Bad parking, kids are getting on our nerves, we're not able to go where we want to go and do what we want to do, and the neighbor's playing their music too loud, and and, and the spouse is nagging me about doing the honeydew list and whatever it is, fill in the blank. But let me ask you a question. What in your life do you complain about most? Maybe you complain about your spouse. Maybe you complain because you're single and don't have a spouse. Maybe you complain about your boss 
or your job, the meetings you have to go to. Maybe your house is too small, money is tight, whatever it is. Maybe it's smaller things, bad weather. Tonight I was complaining because the Wi-Fi was slow and I couldn't use the software I wanted to use so I could share with you verses and PowerPoint graphics while I was teaching because that's the kind of nerd that I am. But the Wi-Fi was slow and I caught myself, even before, 10 minutes before I was fixing to teach you I'm complaining, complaining because the Wi-Fi was slow. Because guess what? Pastors and teachers are human too. And we all complain. Maybe we complain because there's nothing to watch. The, the, let me tell you that the problem isn't the weather. The problem is not the Wi-Fi. The problem is not the lack of food or TV or whatever. The problem is Satan has taken our eyes off of the goodness of God and he's caused us to put it on ourselves. Taking our eyes off the goodness of God and we become focused on self. If the Israelites would have remembered God's goodness, how that he delivered them from Egypt, the, all the miraculous things he did for them, they would have never murmured, murmured, grumbled, or complained. But they were too busy thinking about their current, present situation instead of thinking about what God had done for them and where God was taking them. Now, my favorite Bible character, all-time favorite, is the Apostle Paul. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. If anyone had a right to complain, it was the Apostle Paul. Paul, who was shipwrecked twice. Paul, who was stoned. Paul, who was beaten. Paul, who was persecuted. Paul, who, when he wrote the book of Philippians, which I'm about to read from, was sitting in a prison cell in Rome. Now, catch this. He wanted to go to Rome as a preacher. He wanted to go to Rome to take the gospel. He wanted to go to Rome to spread the gospel to the entire known world. If he could win Rome, he could win the world. But when he got there, it was because he was a prisoner and he spent two years in a prison cell, not just in maximum security and bonds and chains, but in a prison cell chained to a Roman centurion. He would be chained literally his chains attached physically to a Roman centurion, and that centurion was changed every 8 to 12 hours. So he was physically chained to another person who stood outside his cell and guarded him, a big, bad, burly Roman centurion. And in that setting, awaiting possible and, and probable execution for two years, he wrote the book of Philippians. Now, he could have said, this isn't fair. This isn't fair. God, God, you told me, you called me to Rome. The whole book of Romans was written as a treatise to people, the church of Spain to help raise money for Paul to be able to go to Rome as a missionary. It was his life's calling. It was his life's desire. He said, God, I'm serving you. And here I am on a hard floor, nasty food, body aches all over, chained to a Roman centurion who has terrible body odor, awaiting execution, but instead, in Philippians 2 and 14, he wrote this, Do everything without grumbling, complaining, or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Catch that again. Do everything without grumbling, complaining, or arguing. Now, this is good. A good teaching for many physical reasons, many mental reasons, but it's also good for many spiritual reasons. So years ago now, I had the opportunity to read a book by Dr. Travis Bradbury called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. I probably should do a better job of applying this book in my own life. We all could. But from this book, he draws some key ideas about complaining. First, that repeated complaining only hardwires the brain to do more complaining. Repeated complaining hardwires our brain to do more complaining. When we complain, we find it easier to be negative than to be positive. If I already go into a situation looking for negative, I will probably find it. Hence, his third point was confirmation bias. We interpret circumstances based on preconceived ideas. If I go into a relationship with the idea that all women are rotten because another woman treated me rotten, then I'm probably going to find a reason that all women are rotten. That's a preconceived bias or idea that is confirmed 
through my hardwiring my brain through complaining and my perspective, negative perspective. Now, this is what the point I want to make that is spiritual, okay? If you can change your circumstances, you can. I know some circumstances can't be changed. Some things are out of our control, okay? Bad things happen. And I'm not saying they don't. And I'm not saying we don't have a right to ever be sad or be down or whatever. But if you can change your circumstances, then do something about your circumstances. Find a righteous dissatisfaction. Think of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was living in captivity with his people. He had become a cupbearer to the king. But Nehemiah found a righteous dissatisfaction when he heard that the walls of Jerusalem were torn down and that it was a city without walls and an unprotected city. And he found a righteous dissatisfaction that caused him to go to the king and say, King, please let me go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. He didn't just complain, oh my, what's happened to Jerusalem and what are we going to do? But he did something about it because it was within his means to do it. So if you can change your circumstances, do it. Instead of complaining, be part of the solution. Pastor says that all the time. If you have an idea, you have something you want to do, something you want to see different at the church, great. Come to us with it. More than likely, he's going to look at you and say, how are you going to do it? Because we don't want to just complain. We want to be part of the solution. But if you can't change your circumstances, do your best to change your perspective. Paul couldn't do anything about being in a prison cell in Rome. He couldn't break out. God, I mean, I guess God could have come and supernaturally broke him out, but that wasn't happening. And so he decided to change his perspective because that's what he could control. And so he tells us in Philippians 2 and 17, he says this, but even if, I love these words, it echoes the sentiment of the three Hebrew boys when they look at Nebuchadnezzar and say, God can deliver us from you, but even if he doesn't, we will never serve you. Paul says the same thing. Even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, what does this mean? Poured out like a drink offering. Okay. You have to understand that a drink offering was part of uh, temple offerings, that they would offer a burnt offering a lamb or some other animal as a burnt offering, but then they would also offer what was called a drink offering, usually wine or honey, something liquid that was hard to come by and secure, and they would pour it out on the offering as an extra incense and offering before the Lord. Paul says, even if I'm being poured out like that, the sacrifice and service, okay, he uses the word here in the Greek, poured out. The Greek word is spindo, which is where we get the word spent, even if they spend all of me and use everything I have, as long as it's going to God's glory and people are being reached, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Even if it costs me everything I have and I pour it out like a drink offering, like the woman with the alabaster box poured out her alabaster on Jesus' feet. If that's how my life is being used, Wonderful. Now, some think Paul was talking about his eventual martyrdom, how that he was martyred for the gospel and his life was used in that fashion. But this verb here is present passive, meaning it's not I might be poured out like a drink offering or when I am poured out, but it's I am being poured out like an offering. He didn't see his offering as death. He saw his offering as a living sacrifice. He tells us this in Romans, present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service and rejoice when you are spent for all to the glory of God. Catch this again. Paul's in prison. He's facing execution. Yet he tells us rejoice. Rejoice when you're being spent for the glory of God. Why? Because Paul is not the center of his story, but the perspective and the center of his story is focused on Jesus and doing everything for the glory of him. He tells them in Philippians 1, he says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, 
that <clears throat> what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in these chains for Christ. In other words, he's saying, you think I'm a prisoner? You think I'm bound? But what I'm doing is advancing the gospel. History tells us that he was chained to a different Roman guard every day and that while he was chained to those guards, he would preach the gospel to them for hours on end. And even history, not the Bible, history records that one of those prisoners was converted through this message of Paul. So, you know what? You may have me physically bound, but you can't stop me from spreading the gospel. You can't stop me from doing whatever I can to the glory of God because my perspective is not on me being in this prison cell, but it's on God and what he wants to do through me and my life. Old preachers used to say, when you're down to nothing, God is up to something. If I'm here, God has a purpose. God has a reason. God has a lesson. God has an assignment. Paul was chained to a Roman guard, but let me ask you tonight, what are you chained to? Are you chained to a job that you don't like? Maybe you're chained to a health issue that's out of your control. Maybe you have a relationship challenge. If you can change that negative circumstance, change it. Get help. Get counseling. Get more education. Exercise. Whatever it is you got to do, get, get, find a new doctor. Whatever you got to do to get out of that situation, if you can. But if you can't, do your best to change your perspective. Think about it. Paul was chained to a Roman guard in a prison cell, but here we are on lockdown in our homes on quarantine because of COVID-19. And the first couple of days, I'm going to tell you, I was really frustrated because I couldn't cut hair and I've got savings. Please don't think Brother Brian is poor and broken down to his last dollar. I'm not. I purposefully have tried to be responsible and have savings. But a man wants to go out and kill something and drag it home and do his part to feed and care for his family. And the government tells me I can't work. And it's very frustrating. And the first day or two, man, I was mad at the government. I was bad at whoever was, you know, in my mind, it was a hoax, not the virus, but they were blowing things out of proportion. And then you begin to get nervous that what if we get it? And your whole mind's just going nuts. You know what? And I decided to change my perspective. God, what are you trying to teach me during this time? I've realized even as recently as just the last two or three days that I can spend more quality time with my kids. I can do a better job of learning my wife's love language, where I'd been complaining that maybe uh, we didn't always get along like I wanted. I realized recently that her love language is not my love language. My love language is at words of affirmation and bringing me food and gifts, but hers is when I do acts of service around the house without, it being, without her having to ask me. So even if all I learned was how to better my marriage, I've learned something from this circumstance that I wouldn't have learned if I just kept complaining and kept being upset and kept being frustrated. In other words, don't see problems. Look for divine possibilities. Quit looking at obstacles and start seeing opportunity. Stop focusing on what you don't have and be thankful for what you do have. You know what? I do have savings. I am healthy. My wife is healthy. My wife has a job that she's able to work from home. My kids, my oldest is able to do school from home. My youngest is healthy. They're all healthy. They're all happy. We've got food. I mean, only in America, only in America can we complain about being at being in lockdown. And what we're really essentially complaining about is having to sit on the couch and watch Netflix and spend time with our family in nice, comfortable houses with air conditioning and food in the fridge and maybe whatever toilet paper we could scrounge up. That's really the only thing most people haven't been able to find is toilet paper. The rest of the world is living in extreme poverty. So really, we don't have it that bad. Now, I know some people have lost their jobs and don't have their health, and I get that, and I feel very bad for them. But for the majority of us on here tonight, it's probably not been that terrible to slow life down a little bit, spend more time with one another, and enjoy each other. So focus on what we do have. Be thankful for what we do have. Because at the end of the day, I'm not the center of the story Jesus is. 
Psalms 103 says, let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. I don't know who I'm speaking to tonight. Maybe, maybe I've made a fool of myself being vulnerable and just poured out what was on that's Pastor Ray, word vomit and what was on my heart and it wasn't for any of you. And if that's the case, then I apologize. But if I'm speaking to somebody here tonight that you identify with what I'm saying, that life might be difficult, that you might have had the wrong perspective, you might have been bent towards complaining, even if things don't ever go back to normal the way we want. And that's a real possibility. We might have a new normal. We might not be able to go back to everything just the way it was before. But even if we're spent, we're poured out, everything changes, but we're poured out and God uses us for his glory to advance his kingdom, advance his gospel, to advance his good purpose, then let us rejoice and give all praise to him in everything and do everything without grumbling and complaining. Now, um, it's 7.25, so I took 25 minutes to teach. I do want to pray, and then when I'm done praying, uh, I'm going to end this lesson. For those of you, maybe you didn't catch it at the beginning, if you look at the top of the focus group page on Facebook, I shared a post that's got some Zoom meeting information in it. You should be able to follow the link or take that meeting ID and go into Zoom, download it to your computer or smartphone, and put that meeting ID information in and join us if you want to. You don't have to. There's no pressure. But if you want to join us, for a quick Zoom virtual chat. We'd love to chat with you for a few minutes. Been missing all of you. Love you all immensely. Hope you'll join us next week. Uh, we're gonna continue in this vein of my big fat mouth and probably talk about uh, lying. So uh, hopefully none of you struggle with that, but it's still it's good to dig into what does the Bible say about guarding our heart and guarding our mouth. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you tonight for the opportunity to share your word with my friends and to fellowship with one another, even through this virtual medium. I pray, God, your richest blessings upon each of their lives. Lord, I pray that if they are going through a difficult circumstance or a challenge, that you would speak peace to them right now. You are the Prince of Peace, God. You are also a provider and you're able to provide any need that we might have, whether it's physical, financial, mental, spiritual, whatever it is, God, I just pray that you would provide it for your saints. Lord, be with each of us, keep us, protect us, cover us. In your name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, I'm uh, fixing to join the Zoom meeting, so uh, I'm going to close this out, and uh, hopefully some of you will join me over there for fellowship. Love you all. Have a great night.